Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. I apologize about the notes. It ended up being about five pages long, and by the time I hit my little print button and, and crank got out, I, I run out of time. So I got a uh, set for each couple or so, and I've got one extra back there. So uh, This is some uh, great material tonight as far as, as we're looking at what Peter's going to be talking about, and I hope I can communicate it with you. Uh, there's some good information here on the notes, so I'll do the best I can. If you look on the, the right side of the top of the notes, there's a little box with the Greek for chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, I will put this online as a PDF, so you'll be able to click on it, open it up, and then each of those green numbers, will I can actually click on them when it's online. It'll take you to a website that will give you the Greek definition, some more background, each of those words. I mean, if you want to kind of follow up on that, but that's right over there. I'd really like to always have the Greek right there beside it because it's, it's fun to go ahead and look at it and see what words we're talking about. Um, but anyway, well, let's go ahead. I'm going to bow my head and pray. Hopefully we'll get through chapter 1, verse 3, and up through verse 5 tonight. That's kind of what we're looking at. If you look at the very top of the notes, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 is talking about the Father. It's, 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 a, it's a trinity, uh, as you know, but Peter addresses this as a trinity. Then verses 6 through 9 is the Son and, and what's going on as far as his work in the salvation. And then verses twelve or 10 through 12, you've got the, the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of how it's broken down as, as Peter kind of walks you through this. Peter is celebrating our salvation. Peter is discussing our salvation. And what he realizes is these people are under persecution. They've accepted the faith. And they've got a lot of concerns because the worldly pressure, uh, the, the persecution, uh, fear is, is drawing them away, which is completely understandable. And what he is doing is he's, he's really giving them some security in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit's work in their salvation. And their part, which is faith, that they're continuing to stand firm, anticipating these things. And he tells them that their faith is, is, is being tested or it's being... Dokimazo, it's being refined. Dokimazo meaning it's being tested to prove to be as far as genuine. It's, it's, it's being purified. And it's going to result in great rewards. Tonight we're going to talk about inheritance, which I think is the salvation package. And this gives them the potential of earning rewards. And it's some, it's some interesting things here. And some great Christian doctrines, I think, are presented in these verses here. Well, I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for the opportunity to look into the Word of God. We thank you for the things you've preserved for us in written text, that we can examine them and combine them with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We do ask, Father, that we may hear these things, that we may grow, that we may have greater faith, that we may have greater confidence, that we would be able to withstand the, this time on, on earth, not just making it through it, but, Father, by demonstrating your glory and the inheritance that we've already tapped into. Again, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to grow and learn. And again, ask your presence to be with us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and read. Um, let's just say we read down through verse, let's say verse 12. So we kind of hear those things I've just talked about. The Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To God's elect, strangers, sojourners in the world, scattered, there's that word dispor, talking about the Jewish dispersion, throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, those are all areas in, in Turkey going to the north. And again, we've talked about, is that Jews that he's writing to? And many people think this is a Jewish believers that he's addressing, or it could be just Christians or Gentiles that have received the message. They are now finding themselves dispersed among the pagan world. Uh, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge, and we talked about that last week, is that for, you know, uh, knowledge as far as God knowing something ahead of time, or is it for determined, as he determined it because of his knowledge determined, and whichever way you go with that word is going to send you one direction or the other, as far as, you know, predestination or, or, or not. Uh, the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. There's the work of the Spirit. He's sanctifying you for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by His blood. Again, you can see the Trinity in those verses. And the sprinkling by His blood, we use that as a uh, comparison to when the, uh, on Mount Sinai, the, the Isra Israelites with Moses' covenant, the Mosaic covenant, they heard the terms of the covenant. It says, we will obey it. 
the sacrifice was offered and they were sprinkled, they were brought into the covenant. And here you see the words obedience, that's us, we're to be obedient to the faith. And that's right in there with, with the follow-up of sanctifying. The Holy Spirit sets us apart for God, indeed. But the result is to be the Holy Spirit's work in our life is to be that we would be then obedient. And we're obedient to the covenant we've been brought into, which is the covenant of the new covenant. We've been sprinkled with Jesus' blood. So a lot of heavy Jewish overtones in that, but makes, I think, complete sense for us. We're set apart by the Holy Spirit, living an obedient life in agreement with the covenant that we've been brought into. And when did we come into that covenant? When we accepted Christ and we're brought into the new birth. And so he begins talking about, here's the greeting then, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Again, grace, that's God's you know, free uh, offer. Uh, it's not, it's not you know, something you've earned. We know all this. And peace, that's harmony. So God continually gives, and you've got peace, and may you have these things in abundance. That's his blessing. Now, verse 3. I'm going to try to read this without talking now. Verses 3 through 12. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Now, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven, or proved, that's dokimazo, proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now do notice how it is current. We're going to mention inheritance here. When I talk about the inheritance, we're going to make the point that you've already tapped into that inheritance. You're already receiving the inheritance, but it's also stored for you in heaven. I mean, we're not just waiting. We are today sons of God, and we're tapping into it, and we're experiencing it right now, and it's refining us, and there is more to come. Verse 10, concerning this salvation that, we're, that Peter's explaining to them, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And again, after the sufferings of Christ, the resurrection was glorious, our new birth is glorious, our receiving the inheritance and our growth is glorious. I mean, the things that are taking place in our life, we're not just, you know, saved going to heaven. We are being transformed. That's part of that resurrection, the glories that are following. And again, it's just going to snowball and become greater and greater as we move further into eternity. It was revealed to them, the prophets in the Old Testament, that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. So in other words, what he's talking about right here, this is jam-packed with revelation on the glorious, or the glories, the glorious salvation we've received that is, is manifest because of this new covenant. And how rich is it? How deep is it? Even angels are, are wanting to get a, an understanding of the things that we are, we are now partaking in. So anyway, with that being said, let's go back to chapter 1, verse 3, and, and start breaking this down. First of all, the, the beginning right here, uh, he, he begins it like any pagan letter. Again, this is not a pagan letter, but they'd always greet the gods. And so now he's going to now send praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the first thing right there is it's a, a pagan greeting in a sense. They do it in their letters. They, they bless the gods or praise the gods. It also mentions the Jewish God, and so it's got a Jewish flavor to it also. You've got the pagan style with the Jewish God, but watch this become Christian because he breaks apart two things. He takes the Jewish God, or he takes the general concept of praising the gods, focuses on the Jewish God, and then identifies that Jewish God as what? The Father and the Son, and Christianizes. You see it right here. Um, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's right there. That, that's a huge statement right there. It's like we're praising God, right? 
God the Father, who's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so now you've got, again, we call it the Trinity, but you've got two people that are being addressed here as, as deity. The Father, who is the Father of the Son, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see right there, three terms. Lord, uh, that's, that's an Old Testament reference to God. Jesus, that's his man's name. I mean, in fact, it means uh, Jehovah saves or Jehovah save us. Uh, and then Christ, which is the, the Messiah, which means Christos is the Greek word for the Hebrew word for Messiah, which basically means the anointed one. So you've got God, the man, the anointed one, the Messiah. So you can see him breaking it apart right there. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in his great mercy, when it starts says, in his great mercy, now we're going to go back to the Father and talk about what he has done. But going back to the notes, please. There's this greeting right here. If you notice in 1 Peter 1, 3, I've got three bullet points there at the top of page 1. It says, praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've got that underlined. Do notice it's identical to how Paul begins 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just, you know, just so you know this, I mean, make, you know, make a, a note of it. It would seem, you know, Paul, the rabbi, is using it. Peter, uh, the Galilean fisherman, is using it. One is, is writing, you know, you know, maybe from Jerusalem. The other's traveling in the, the Gentile worlds. You'd think that, you know, they didn't just stumble upon this and use the same terminology. It's probably that, that reference right, what we just read is probably a... Uh, something they use in their church services. It's probably something that they say in their liturgy. It's probably, you know, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It probably helps identify the Jewish God and Jesus the man and brings them together. It's probably a common statement. It probably wasn't original with Paul or original with Peter necessarily, but it is interesting you see that used right there. In the few letters that we do have, you see it three times. Now let's just look at 2 Corinthians 1 3 there on the page. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Just interesting, Paul takes it from there, goes to the God of compassion and comfort. And Paul's going to begin talking about his troubles and trials and, and trying to connect it with the Corinthians there. Uh, Ephesians 1.3, Paul says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to go to this eventually. Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He goes now to that the spiritual blessings. And that's eventually going to be the inheritance we're going to talk about tonight. And again, you, you, you always be thinking and judging, but I'm going to tie together, I believe, at least I'm going to present it this way, that the salvation we've received is the inheritance, which is referred to here as every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is what? That's the inheritance. Well, how do you get the inheritance? It's part of your salvation. It, it's kept it. It's yours. So I'm separating and, and I think I'm right, but I'm, I, you know, you, you start navigating through and start splitting hairs on some of these things. This inheritance is not rewards. You can call it a reward. You can be excited about it. I can't wait to get the full inheritance. But this is not a reward, I don't think. I think this inheritance is your salvation package. I think it's Ephesians 1, every spiritual blessing in Christ. Here it is. And within that spiritual blessings, within that inheritance, within our salvation, is now the opportunity as a son of God to step up and mature and begin to produce and perform and do the things, he, the good deeds he's called us to do. Now we're executing, we're using this salvation, we're using this inheritance, we're using every spiritual blessing, not just, oh, thank you, thank you, receiving it. You're now taking and producing something with it. That is itself going to be reward. That's how I'm looking at it right now. And as I continue to study, you know, I, I refocus and look at things differently. But that's what I think we're looking at here. Okay. But anyway, we'll hopefully get to Ephesians 1 and maybe look at that as we get into the text tonight. And then, of course, 1 Peter 1 here tonight. Uh, praise be God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection. Peter is talking about not the compassion and the comfort of Peter in, in 2 Corinthians, or not of every spiritual blessing as, as Paul, Peter, uh, Paul does in Ephesians, although it's very close. He's talking about the new birth and the living hope that we have from that. Okay. I think the next part of the notes I've mentioned already, uh, the, apply the title Father to God. And you can see I mentioned that earlier. So that, you know, God receives the title. Instead of just being uh, God or Yahweh, uh, they, they change it. They give him a title that Jesus used. They call him Father. 
And he receives the title here, which gives them room when, when God manifests on the earth, he manifests as the Son. And so now you've got two manifestations of the Trinity, uh, of, of the two persons of, of, of the Trinity. Okay. The first word there in chapter 1, verse 3, the word praise, it is these words right here. You, the go, uh, if we want to say it this way, I should write it. I've got English and Greek words written there. L E G O. You, it means, U E, it means well, it means to, to do well. And lego, it means to speak or to speak well. We get our word eulogy. This right here, you lego, or as you see right there, in, 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 I've got it written down right there, it's the word logos, which is word. This means to speak. So lego means to speak well, to speak well of someone. And so the word eulogy, you can see, you can see it right here, it, it's Greek origin. When you do a eulogy for someone, what are you doing? You're stepping up and you're speaking well about them. You're saying good things about them. So that's what the word praise means. So speak well to say good things. We're blessing, we're praising God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and the reason we're praising him, I've got some words underlined there. I, I wanted to do it throughout my notes, but I, I broke down and didn't continue to do it. Try to underline the words that I'm going to be addressing. But praise, eulogy, or eulogo. Uh, it, 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 next thing it says is in his great mercy he's given us new birth and so the word mercy uh, we know what mercy means obviously but what is interesting here is the Greek word that is used here is used in the Septuagint that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures to translate the Hebrew word and you know this word hasid which is that covenant love. It's, it's where God has got a covenant. It's, it's the word uh, love or loving, uh, uh, what's with loving compassion, what is loving? Oh, what is it? How do they have to translate that uh, in some of the older Bibles? Uh, see, I'm looking for it here. Uh, loving, compassionate love. What, you know what I'm talking about? I've got it in my notes there somewhere. Not emotional love. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not emotional love. Uh, covenant right. love. It's the covenant love. Maybe I didn't even type it in there, but there's an old-fashioned way of saying it. Um, I, I, just, I just forgot it. But you see it in Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 34, where it talks about God maintaining a seed, and that's the Hebrew word for his, he's got a covenant love. I've got a, a contract, a covenant love. I will show, it's that loving, compassionate love. I'm going to be there for you, no matter what. We can see it when we study the book of Judges, basically. Uh, we talked about that on Monday night. We got all the we got a culture that's going astray. We, we've got judges who are more Canaanite in their thinking than they are Jewish. They know more about the Canaanite gods and taking vows to the Canaanite gods than they know the Mosaic covenant. But God, because of His hasi, because of His love, there it is, loving kindness. That's what I'm looking for. Because of His loving kindness, and again, that's not emotion; it's contractual. He's got a covenant with these people. What does He do? He raises up a judge. He raises up Gideon. How come? Because Gideon's a great man? No. Because of his hasid, because of his covenant love, these are my people. I am going to raise up Gideon and do the best I can with what he'll understand. He's got to throw out a fleece. He's going to make an ephod. He's going to think he's the new king. He's going to, and he's going to have a son named Abimelech. And then Abimelech's going to rise. And we know we're going through all these things. And so God is responding not because the people are deserving it, He's not responding because he's emotional. He's not responding because he's just you know, going to do it for everybody. He's doing it because of his, his covenant love, his seed. And then when, in the, when they translated that into Greek, they used the same word we see translated here as mercy. So let's read this again. Praise or say good things to God the Father, the, or to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because in his great mercy, in his great loving kindness, in his great hasid, because of his contract. And that contract, that covenant now, is going to come through nothing we've done. He hasn't made a contract with us. It was God the Father making a, Jesus talked about it, you know, the new covenant in Jesus' blood. He made a covenant with Jesus because God the Father has mercy. He's got now a covenant with Jesus Christ. Praise be, say good things to God because he's made a covenant with Jesus who was thinking about us. And that's how, that's how, that's how we get into this whole thing. 
These two are rocking and rolling in eternity. God's making covenants. Jesus is performing. And we get brought into this right here. And so Peter's saying, say good things, eulogize God because of his mercy. And again, be careful of that word mercy. It's like, well, he just does nice things. It's like that word is bigger than just, you know, he's merciful. It's, he, he, there's something happening there. It's, it's that translation of the word seed. Okay, so that's the word mercy, and you can see it pointed out right there. Now it says, so because of God's mercy, we've been given new birth, and, and this new birth puts us into a, two things. We're going we're gonna to talk about this new birth. That's a new word coming up right here in just a moment. It's going to take us two ways. Two things are going to be given to us. A living hope and an inheritance. And that is what Peter's focusing on. Say good things about the Father because of His mercy, some kind of a covenant. That covenant has made it possible for us to have a new birth. Oh, we're excited. We're born again. We're, we're sons of God. Right. But the reason you're excited about this new birth, just like when a child is born. I mean, you think about this, and, and make sure I don't overstate this. But when a child is born, when a baby is born, we celebrate the birth of the child. You know, they're cute, mom and dad are happy, everybody's healthy, they've added another member to the family. But why is that exciting? Again, let me see if I can sum this up. We're excited about the birth of a baby because of the potential. You know, it's like, what's this child going to be? We can't wait for them to, you know, roll over. We can't wait for them to walk or begin to talk in sense. Because why? Because we just want them to roll over forever? It's like, no, because when they're rolling over, that means they're about ready to start crawling. And when they crawl, they're going to pull themselves up and start walking. They start walking, they're going to start doing things. And we can take them place and they start talking. We can show them things. We can interact with them because this child is going to be, we've got a, we've got a grandchild in our home right now. And so we all think, we, I, could t I could spend the rest of this evening telling you how much potential this child has. I mean, he's quick. He's, he's always busy. I can teach him things. He, this child has potential. Now, I'm not excited that this child is going to, and you understand all of this, I'm sure, that this child is going to be in my house forever and ever and ever. It's like, I'm doing my part because this child is going somewhere, going to do some great things. I can tell you all the potential he's got. My whole point. The new birth... Peter is mentioning this new birth because of the hope it brings us and the inheritance we've been given. This is like your supply, and we'll talk about that some more. That these are those blessings that we have in Christ. We have them now. The inheritance is both now and in eternity. We don't have the fullness of the inheritance, but we do have enough of the inheritance that we can sink our teeth into it and we can start growing. And there's hope of where we're going. So he's saying good things about the Father because of his mercy through Jesus Christ the covenant. We've been given new birth into a living hope and an inheritance. This is all, you think about it, this is all about potential. Praise God. Look at the potential we've got. And this is where we're going to go. And he's trying to, what he's doing, he's, we are, we're learning from this, but remember who he's writing to. He's writing to some people that have jumped in both feet. We're Christians, we're saved, we're believers. And all of a sudden, the pagan world starts pressing in. They start getting persecuted. It's kind of like, we're, we're getting crushed here. I'm not sure if this is worth it. And Paul and Peter's telling him, no, you keep looking at God. He has done something tremendous. He's got you out of this situation, got you a new life, a new birth, with hope and an inheritance that you're tapping into now. Your faith is being tested, and it's going to be proven worth, worth more than gold. Just, just don't quit. Don't give up on this. And again, that's, I think, what was, was being taken place here. Uh, let's turn the page two, please. Um, when it says there, uh, let me go back and read chapter one, verse three. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, the word in, or in his mercy, it is at the top of page, page two, it is the word kata. And we mentioned this word last week, kata. It means down. And it means, it, it, you know, it can mean down like going down on something. But in this case, it means domination. In other words, the origin according to his, right here, according to his great mercy. Or because of his great mercy. Because this, is, this, this mercy is pushing this thing forward. This mercy is pushing this new birth forward. Because of his great mercy. Because of that mercy, he's pushing this thing. It, it's what's driving the new birth. He's got to get this out to us. He's got to make this happen. So again, that's the word kata or 
according to, because of, has again the ideal of force or, or something determinative taking place. And here's our word, new birth. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you anything new here, okay? I mean, it's not like, when, it, you know, when am I going to learn something new? Well, hopefully not tonight. You, know, you start learning new things from me, from First Peter, uh, it's kind of like, okay, we're just stepping into a cultish area. There's nothing new going to happen here. We're going to talk about the new birth. But I am going to give you maybe some insight. And you can see on your notes right there, we've got the word is Anna, and a word that you can, uh, it's G-E-N-N-E-O. This is the word, and you can see right there, it, 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 it's a word that means, again, okay, you think of uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there's a group that were called the Anabaptists, the Anabaptists. And you always wonder who Anna is. I mean, it took me years. Who's this Anna? Is she like the queen? Was she, was she a female preacher? Who was Anna? And the Anabaptists, Anna means re, or it means again. Like a, like a prefix. It means again. So the Anabaptists in the Protestant Reformation were who? They were Catholics, basically, in a general sense. They're Catholics who've been baptized as infants. The Protestant Reformation broke out and people got it. And the word says, we're not, we're not going to be bound to this, this, this church structure where we've got to follow all these sacraments and, and we've got all our salvation is based on what we do to the church. We're going to have faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to have personal faith in Jesus Christ. And now that I, I've never had personal faith before, I've been a member of the church my whole life. I've gone through all the sacraments my whole life. I've taken communion and done mass. But it's, it, it hasn't meant anything because now I have a personal relation with Jesus Christ. So now I'm ready to be baptized. And so it was a, it's not a big deal in our culture, but at this time it was a huge slap in the face uh, it, it meant power was moving. It meant money was moving. It meant that culture was revolting. You're going to have now two different churches. And they would say, now that I'm a believer and I understand, I am going to be baptized. And they'd say, you've already been baptized. And they'd say, well, then I'm going to be anabaptized. Or I'm going to be baptized again. I'm going to be baptized a second time. And now I'm in, in the faith. And, of course, if you know the Protestant Reformation, we've talked about it at different times. That's when, when the killing began. That's when the Catholics began killing the Protestants because they're leaving and they're getting baptized. Like, so to be an Anabaptist often meant death or major persecution because, you, anyway. The reason I say all that is just to give you a background or that's how this word is used that we know another way. So uh, Anna, again, and Geneo, it means generation. And so right here, to be generated again. Again, generated. And, and what we're tying into here, and this is, if you look in the notes here somewhere, um, I'm trying to see if I wrote it down here somewhere. Yeah, it's the fourth bullet point. The word is only used by Peter here and in chapter 1, verse 23. Nobody else uses this word. The word that means, you'd think it'd be used often. There's, in other words, there's other, this is not a, a unique uh, concept. We'll look at a couple of the verses of the new birth. The new birth exists throughout the scriptures. But this is a unique word. Peter's the only one to put Anna and Geneo, or regeneration, together to describe this. And then he does it again in chapter 1, uh, verse 23. I'm going to read verse 23 right now. For you have been born again. Anna, Geneo, regenerated. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. And then he goes on and talks about the Word of God. So this, that's the end of this chapter. What we're beginning to talk about here, that's how he ends this chapter, saying you haven't been born again or regenerated from something of the earth or some religious structure or some philosophy. You've been regenerated by the very Word of God. The very Word that created the universe has regenerated you, or translated in the NIV here, uh, born again. So those are the, and again, in the Greek, that's the only place, only times that that pops up. While we're saying this, let's look into, uh, yep, on the page right here, on top of page, I think it's two, I should put numbers on this. James chapter 1, verse 18, I'm going to just read this. He this is James writing. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So there's James talking about giving us birth. And clearly James is talking not about the first birth of being born as a, a human. He's talking about a spiritual experience. And then John chapter 1, verse 13. This is now John. So you got James 
and John, John in chapter 1, verse 13, as he begins the book over the Gospel of John, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. Talk about people being born again. Of course, Jesus says it in chapter 3. Yes, ma'am. The term born again was used in John 3, 3, but maybe in the Right, it's it's not it's not on a It's not. It's it's something different. That's interesting. Yes, yeah. Now because that could have been from born above, from above or beyond. Right. Right. That's why sometimes they that, that's in the in the footnotes, born above or something. Um, yeah, and I, I'm not I'm not ready to go take a look at that. Um, but I will. See what see what I've got anything written in there. But yeah, it's I tell you the truth, no one can hear the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by saying you must be. There it is, born again. Okay, I do have these words written here. Okay. Yep, the first word born is Janeo, 509. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The word that they're using is anothen. Anothen. Good. <laughs> I mean, you know, you make these statements, then it's like, oh, am I sure? Yeah. So it's it's geneo, same word, born, geneo, or generated, and the word is anothen, and the and I'm gonna go back and look at that again. And that's where you can even see it sometimes it's translated above. The word word means from above, again, from the beginning. It is interpreted by Nicodemus to mean again. So it's a different, it's not ana, which means re or again. Is anathen, which means from above or anew or something else. Um, and Nicodemus hears it as again. I mean, it's, they're just, I, we're not talking about a new concept at all. It's just, I guess the only thing that's, I mean, not the only, probably other things, the thing that's interesting for me about it is he didn't use what James uses or what John uses or what even Jesus uses. Peter's talking, to, he, he's, he's, he's taking the concept and and making it unique for these people and trying to put it in a way that you've been born again, you've been reborn you know, again, a different way, a different time. Uh, you can almost, for me, I can hear him he's not just a parrot. He's not just cranking out what everybody else is saying. He's, he's a communicator. He's trying to say it and write it in a way that these people will hear it again for the first time. Now, I'm, I'm adding that to it, but it is unique that he's. this is the only time he's using it. So, let's go back and let's look at some more notes here on this very quickly so there's anything else I wanted to say about this. Um, but he uses it twice here in this first chapter, and again, it, it, it's nothing unique. We can see it throughout the, the New Testament. Uh, chapter 1, verse 3 of 1 Peter. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. Again, that's that word, hasid, translated from, a, you know, in Greek. He has given us uh, a new birth, ana geneo, and here it is, into a living hope, giving us a new birth. Uh, again, we've been taken from, uh, again, we've been born not into this world, and as we know throughout this book of First Peter, he's going to be big on, this is your forefathers, this is the way of life handed down to you, this is the empty way of life, but now you've been born again, and now over here in this age, this side, you've got hope, you've got something new. So don't, don't worry about these people that are persecuting you. They're, they're persecuting you from, from an area of, of death, of something that has not productive. You're over here. They just don't understand what you've got. You've got hope. You've got an inheritance that you've tapped into now, and it's going to continue to expand as you continue to develop or understand this salvation. Okay, now uh, I'm going to go down into uh, the next word, into. You've been born again. And the word, uh, in his great mercy, he's given us birth into a living hope, into or in or unto is different ways it's translated. And you can see that word right there. It's, it's this word in the Greek, just so you can see it right there. Uh, ice, it's a preposition. It means so that we have. In other words, we've been given new birth so that we have. So into is good, but this would be maybe better. Uh, so that we have. In, in other words, you can see... It's not that you've been born again 
end of this right here, but it's the idea that you've been born into something that you no longer, you didn't used to have this. You're, you're now in it. We're heading towards the discussion of an inheritance. You used to be over here, but you've been born again. And, and again, we think, well, we're born again, so we get to go to heaven. Right. But the reason you get to go to heaven is you've been born into this sphere, which I think helps us understand a lot of Paul's teaching in Ephesians, especially when he talks about being in Christ, in this sphere. You've been born into this sphere over here. You've been born into, you've been born so that we have. You're not going to heaven just because you've been born again. You're going to heaven because you've been born again. Again, I, I, you are going to heaven because you're born again. But it's not just the kind that you've been born again. It's the kind that you've been born again into this salvation, this inheritance. You're, you're born again into Christ. The reason you're going to heaven is you've been born again into Christ. You're, you're in something new. You're in a new sphere. And that helps unravel that whole concept of being in Christ in the New Testament. And Peter's, you know, you can just see him, I think, you can see him saying the same thing, but maybe in a, in a different way, with different terms. Okay. In his great mercy, in his covenant, he has given us new birth, uh, uh, you know, again born, into something else. And what you've been born into, he describes it now, you've been born into this living hope. This is, and this living hope, this idea here, living means it's, it's happening now. You're, you're not waiting for it. You've been born in this living hope, and this living hope is now going to drive. Let's, let's really read on here. A uh, hope is living. It, it, it is energizing the believer. Uh, it means it is focused not on the past. Again, this focus is not on the fact that, you know, in 1977 I was born again. This is focused on, right, you were born again into where you're at today. It's about where you're going and where you're developing. And so the focus is on, on the future, on, on your progress. And we talked about the child there a little bit. Um, and again, it's both time and eternity. And let's read that. Let's go on with this. Let me read this again. Chapter 1, verse 3. In His great mercy, He's given us a new birth into a living hope. And here's how it happens. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This has happened. Now we've been talking about union. This has happened because of what Jesus Christ has done. It ties back to that word mercy, the covenant, the thing that Jesus did. Jesus, Hebrews calls Him the pioneer. He's gone before us. He's blazed the trail. He's gone ahead of us. And now we're unified. Paul talks about being in Christ, unified with Christ. But watch this. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the word from is another interesting word or important word. Uh, it's, it's the word from the dead. It doesn't mean away from, you know, away from the edge. I think I've got it written down at the very bottom of the page. It could have been the word A-P-O, which also can be translated from, but has more of the idea of from the edge of death, who's been resurrected from away from the edge of death, the word instead is used, ek, meaning up out of. It's not like over here was death and he was moved over here towards or from or away from death over here another direction. He, the dead are still there. Death is still there. He was one of them, but he's been resurrected ek or up and out of, away from. They're there. He is now somewhere else. And that goes back into Again, it helps us build that image of the sphere that we are in. This was the dead. Jesus Christ has been resurrected up from out of the dead. He is now over here. The dead are still here. Jesus Christ is ek, up from out of. He's no longer here. And so you've now received new birth. Where did you receive that new birth? You've received, again, a new birth from wherever you were at. And since you were in the same sphere, uh, in any of my illustration, and you've received new birth through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've now been brought, you are now over here. And this is, again, that living hope. You're not here. You've got a whole other area that you're functioning in. And, again, the living hope and an inheritance. And Peter's intention is to try to set a stage for good news for these believers who are struggling with this world that doesn't understand this. And you can see, and, again, be careful here. Try, I mean, these, this, this is some very simple theology, but yet it's very, very deep. This, this goes, you know, this is the core of, of what we have. Again, it's first Peter, Peter's first words. And I'm very impressed with it, Peter, that Peter's put this together. It's very well done, I think, obviously. But if you don't make this distinction, 
and the, the tendency is when this world starts causing this world problems and you find yourself living in this world, what do you want to do? Just gravitate back. So it just kind of, this becomes something like this. This becomes, here's the world, and the, you know, the dead, and here's, and it's easy to kind of just kind of live right here. And on Monday, Tuesday nights, we run over here, maybe step over there, and we run back over here. So the world doesn't, it, it, we're kind of the same. This is trying to give the impression, and, and, and they're having trouble. And, and what they're trying to do, they're having trouble living over here in this sphere. And they're probably, just like we, it's easier to say, okay, let's just, let's just temper down and, and blend this back together. And Peter's encouraging him, saying, no, that, that's the natural reaction. Uh, this is what's going to take place. Okay, let's go back to the text here of these words here. Um, from the dead, we've got several things I've got written down right there. Let's go to verse 4. Chapter 1, verse, verse 4. I'm going to read verse 3 and read right in verse 4. So praise, eulogy, say good things about God. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the God who became a man, who's the Messiah. In His great mercy, in this mercy, or in or because of, the mercy drove this covenant. Or he, the reason He's got mercy is it's, it's driven by the fact that this mercy is there, this covenant is made with His Son. He has given us again birth, a, a regeneration again, a new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from out of among the dead. So Jesus Christ has come out. You've been brought over here in this new birth. You now are here in this, this living hope. I mean, you're going somewhere. Things are happening in your life, even though you feel persecuted. And verse 4, not just uh, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but he, you're also put into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed. Man, that's again a loaded sentence. I do want to point this out, and we won't get there tonight. But notice right here, are shielded through faith. Here's talking about faith, and this is your personal faith. You are shielded by your faith. I think we're going to see something here. This inheritance is secure. Okay, I mean... Secure. We'll look at these words, and we'll talk about them here in more detail. An inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. And those are some very simple English words describing some, some good concepts. This inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. So you, can, can you lose it? Can you screw it up? Can you waste it? It's like, well, it can never perish, spoil, or fade. So then look at this. Kept in heaven. It's like, so now how are you going to get there to do this to it when you can't do it if you could get there? Kept in heaven, which means kept and it's being preserved there continually in heaven for you. Now, so anyway, that, that is your inheritance. That is your salvation. That is every blessing that is in Christ. It's like, well, I think I messed it up. Again, you, you, you got to put more than just these verses together. But from what I'm reading here, this agrees with what I think is you can't mess up the salvation. It, it is something God has done to you. You've received it. It's been done. It's permanent. It's unchangeable. It can never perish, spoil, or fade. And so when Paul talks about uh, the spiritual blessings in Christ, this is it. When we talk about being saved, this is it. When Peter talks about an inheritance, this is it. It's all this package that we have at our salvation. That's the way I'm reading. That's what I believe right here. Again, I'm, I'm trying to learn and teach us as we go. But anyway, it, and it's kept in heaven for you, who through faith, now this is going to produce this faith. And this, just a little background here, that's why I try to teach this to saints, because if you can understand this, your faith is going to grow. And now it's you're shielded through faith, or through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. So this is the truth. If we can put this faith, this, uh, this truth into the hearts of believers, this faith is going to grow, and you're going to move into this world in faith, and you're going to be shielded, and watch this, shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Now right here, coming of salvation, well I thought we already had salvation, but we know one, two, three, the three phases of salvation. Uh, you, you're going to have a, a justification, we call that phase one, where you're justified before God. 
phase two, sanctification. That is what's taking place in time right now. And phase three, glorification. That's the complete phase or the final phase. And that is the package. You, you have been justified in the past. You are saved in the past. You are being saved right now as that process begins. You're re this is the salvation of your spirit. This right now is the salvation of your soul, of your mind. You're being renewed in your thinking, your understanding. And ultimately, the glorification is going to manifest in your body. You will be saved physically, the resurrected body. So in other words, your spirit is saved. It's done in the past. You're not, you're not going to mess it up. We are working on your soul in your lifetime. Tonight, we're working on the sanctifying, the, the renewing of your mind. There's nothing we can do about your body. I mean, you know work out, you know, eat right. But, I mean, we're waiting for this. That's not part of salvation. That's just part of, you know, avoiding and driving past McDonald's or something. But then I didn't say that. Okay. But anyway, that's glorification right there. And so when we talk about this, our salvation, you can see it right here. You are secure. Your soul, spirit, your salvation is secure. But your faith, right now, your faith in your mind, your understanding, is helping shield you in this dark world as you wait for the coming of the salvation. This is salvation. This is salvation. But you're waiting for salvation. So you can, it's kind of interesting you see that right there. I wasn't planning on pointing that out tonight, but I wanted to kind of show us where we're going with this. So let's go back up and we want to talk about the inheritance, especially those words describing it. So we're at the bottom of whatever page we're on. And there's the word inheritance is kleron, kleron omia. Kleron omia is the Greek word right there. And here we go. First of all, it, it can refer to property that you've already received as property that you will receive. So and this is useful for our understanding of the blessings we have in Christ. Kleroma is inheritance. But for example, if you may be living if in the real world, the natural world, you may be, have received an inheritance already and you may be living in your inheritance. Let's say you received property or a house. You would still say, this is my inheritance. I, I inherited this estate. You're already living there. It can refer to an inheritance you're currently living in. But it can also refer to an inheritance you're waiting someday in the future to receive. So this is both an inheritance, even in the word itself, both present and and future. You have part of it now, but you're waiting for the fullness of it later. And that's that's the word. And it fits perfectly with our description here in the, in the New Testament. Uh, it refers to the here it refers to salvation that has received an experience on earth. I've already pointed that out. Now, what's interesting here, I wanted to point this out too. And you kind of miss this, at least at least you know I do when I first just read through it, is we're talking about being born or reborn. And when someone is born, you've got a child. I'll just write son, make the illustration easy. You've got a son. Well, as soon as you have a son legally, what's the next thing you go to? Is that son is going to be the, the heir. And so as soon as you start talking about a son, you start talking about inheritance. Anyway, I've got two verses right here. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, Romans 8, 17. So you are no longer in Galatians 4. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And as soon as you say son, that trips off what? And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. So to be a son means you are an heir. I mean, that, that's, that, that's, and that's where you can see Peter's mind going. You're talking about born again or being born anew. And as soon as you're talking about birth, your mind goes through the son receiving an inheritance. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now... If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. See that co-heirs with Christ? That putting us back in that sphere. Christ is the sphere, and we've been born again into that sphere. We've been, we are identifying with Christ. We're heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. And that's kind of what Peter's talking to. He's talking about those that are suffering in Christ suffering along with Christ's sufferings here in this world as we're trying to live in this sphere of the new birth in a world that's rejecting it, living, trying to live a, 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 life, a life of righteousness in a world where the, of the dead. Well, it says if you'll endure with Christ, you'll also then share in his glory. So again, right here, because we've mentioned son, we're talking about an inheritance. And now what is this inheritance? We've already talked about, I think identified it several times. 
Um, right here, the word is into or to inheritance. It's ace again. It means you are born into this inheritance. We've talked about that. And uh, there are three words that are used to describe it. Incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading. At this point, I was, I was wanting to, and I, just gonna, I want you to just flip over there and look at it. I'm not going to take time to do it. But right now, I think when we mention the word in here, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'll read the first verses, but I'm going to stop. But when we start talking about inheritance, this is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 1. This sphere, this, well, here we go. Chapter 1, verse 3 of Ephesians. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Heavenly realms, every spiritual blessing in Christ. And here he goes. For he chose us to be in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. goes all the way through. Uh, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 9, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Verse 11, in him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, uh, that we might be for the praise of his glory. It goes all the way through until he gets to verse 15 and says, finally, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, and your love for the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. In other words, he's thanking God. He's saying, you know, thanksgiving to God, or in a sense, good things again, because they are now in this, this salvation. Again, I don't think chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 is anything other than describing salvation, what you have in Christ. Okay, let's go back to the notes and finish this up. I want to just talk, look at what this is talking about, these words uh, describing the inheritance. We'll pick this up next week. Um, you have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead and into an inheritance. And this inheritance that you have can never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you. First of all, the word uh, incorruptible or imperishable basically means this. It cannot rot or decay. This is the opposite of earthly things. For example, 1 Corinthians 9 and 15 talks about earthly things decaying or being temporary. It's permanent. It will not wear out. It cannot be lost because it's incorruptible. Uh, this word is used to describe these things. In, uh, this is used to describe... God, it's used to describe heaven, it's used to describe God's word and resurrected bodies. So these are other things that are called incorruptible. God, heaven or the glory of God, God's word and resurrected bodies. This, this inheritance is also on the same level as God, heaven, God's word and our resurrected bodies. It is incorruptible. It, it's, it's, it's not going to fade away. The next word is undefiled. This inheritance is undefiled, or this salvation, these blessings we have in Christ. Morally and religiously, it is pure. Uh, for example, I, again, this, I'm going to make a theological statement here. Now, this makes complete sense to me, but I, I may be wrong because there's groups of people that disagree with this. But that second circle under defiled, the second bullet point, you, the believer, cannot defile this inheritance. Now, you're right there, boom, we just split groups again. It's like, well, can you lose your salvation? I, I'm saying, and I might be wrong, but this lines up with the rest of my theology. This inheritance is undefiled, and undefiled refers to staining something with sin. If you look in the Old Testament, the, the land became defiled because of Israel's sin, and, and the land was unclean. They didn't lose the promise, they lost the land, but they defiled the land. This inheritance according to the way I'm putting this together, is under, a, we don't want Christians to sin. We're not encouraging sin. But the idea here is if you, if you are in this sphere, if you are in Christ and you mess up, you sin, you get back into the world of the dead and you do bad things or whatever, you can't tarnish the blessings that are in Christ. You can't tarnish, you can't defile with your sin this inheritance. Now again, we're talking about inheritance. We're not talking about rewards and producing Again, the concept is you're going to take this inheritance. Anytime a father gives a son an inheritance, the concept is they're going to take the inheritance and squander it. It's like, no, they're going to take the inheritance and change the world with it. They're going to produce something with it. They're going to be mature and use it. 
Uh, that's why even we just read that verse in Galatians, right there, Galatians 4, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Remember when we went to the book of Galatians, a son many times was under the leadership of a slave until he was age 12 or 14 or 16, whatever the age, the legal age. And once that slave had trained that son to be a man, to be mature, he, he, he left the status of just being a, a child and was actually, the father would actually adopt his own son, legally adopt him into manhood and give him his inheritance with the idea that something good was going to happen. But until he was old enough, he kept him with the slave and the slave would teach him all the studies. He'd watch him do his homework. He trained, the slave is never going to become a son, although they could, and it happened in Roman history, the, 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 the free man would adopt a slave as a son and give him the inheritance. It can happen. But the concept was the slave would train the son when he was ready. Okay. With that being said, I don't think the child can defile the inheritance because it's, it's, it's undefiled. It's, it's protected. You can defile your natural inheritance, but you can't this one. I think that's what it's saying. And unfading. Uh, this word is only used by Peter, and it's related to a word that we see in chapter 5, verse 4. I'm going to flip over there and show you that one. Chapter 5, verse 4. Unfading. Okay. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. It's, it's a different word, but it's the same, root, same, uh, same word in a different form. Never fade away. And Peter, again, is the only one to use this word. Unfading. This was only used by Peter. Uh, it's like, unlike the flowers that fade, it's unaffected by time, it's unaffected by conditions, it never loses its beauty, it never loses its glory. So with that all being said and done, I'm going to go to, I hope, the last page of the notes. Oh, good, we're there. We're running out of time. And uh, right here, uh, besides being incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, this inheritance is guarded and is in heaven. So you've got this right here. You can't, uh, the last thing I've got there, this inheritance is totally secure. It cannot be spent, can't be lost, can't be corrupted, can't be cashed in, can't be exchanged, can't be damaged. With time, with corruption, with sin, with conditions, with attitude, because it is eternal and it is guarded. It's kept in heaven for you, guarded by God. Now, that is how people, again, we have to quit, obviously, because one, I'm out of notes. Uh, two, we're out of time. But remember, that's, that's not just, that's where we're at in the book. That, that's not, and so that's the point of Peter's book. No, Peter's laying, this is still the first three, four verses. Peter's laying foundation. He's building a case, and then he's going to come after them and help them with their faith. So don't think, well, that's just, you know, that's, that was interesting, but there's not a lot, a lot there. It's like... You know, this is foundation for what Peter's going to say. He's still doing his he's still doing his intro, if you understand what I'm saying. He's still introducing his message. <laughs> it just takes me weeks to get through Peter's introduction. So here we are. I appreciate your time. Thank you for taking time to be here. I'm going to pray and then we will be done. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank that we have here before us. We do ask that we would not squander it ourselves, that we would embrace our inheritance. We'd, we'd embrace Jesus Christ and the sphere of the salvation that he's given to us and every blessing we have in Christ. We ask that we, we would mature, that we'd be able to produce the, the fruits of righteousness and the good works that you've called us to. We do thank you for this word. We thank you for the spirit that you've placed inside of us. And we thank you for fellowship we have with other believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for your time.